Good morning. 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 You all doing okay? I hope so. Well, some of you said yes. The rest of you, I think, are still asleep. So glad that you're here this morning. Hey, grab a Bible if you have one. Turn to the book of Genesis, okay? Uh, As you're finding that in Genesis, we're going to be in chapter 40 this morning. Um, I wanted to let you know of a meeting that we are having tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here in this room. And, uh, and so we've been on this journey for the last several years, really seeking after what it is that God would have for us as a church and what might be next. And we're kind of talking about some of that today, actually, in this message. But um, we're just, we have some information that we want to share with you. I do want to say, this is not a business meeting. This is just an informational meeting. So we're just gathering together. I have some things I want to share with you, some things that have, um, we've been waiting for about six or eight months as I shared some news with you about what's happening with real estate and some stuff like that. And we finally have a few things that are happening. We want to talk about that. And then we're going to kind of give you some instructions on what we're going to do over the next little bit of time. So uh, if you're able to make it, we'll be right here at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. If you're not able to make it, watch your email tomorrow. If you've subscribed to our, uh, our weekly newsletter that we send out, if you've subscribed to that, then we're going to send an email out that would give you a link Uh, so that you can watch this. If you want to watch it live, you'll be able to watch it live, or it'll be archived somewhere as well. Um, You won't be able to interact. There won't be an opportunity for you to have questions if you're online, but um, you'll be able to kind of view it and see it, okay? So just check your email. If you subscribe to our email and you don't see an email every Friday from us, then you probably want to check in your spam or your promotions folder or something like that if you've subscribed, so you should be getting something from us, and that information will be in, uh, in that email tomorrow, okay? So I uh, would love for you to join us and just kind of hear it. Even if you're not uh, a member here at the church, you're welcome to come and attend and hear and, uh, and dream and pray with us as we just are seeking after what it is that God has for us, okay? So that's where we are. Um, we're in Genesis 40. We're in this series called Detours. Uh, and it's a great, I don't know, it's been a great reminder for me um, how things don't always go the way that I want them to go. I don't know if that happens to any of you in your life, but that happens to me in my life um, really more often than I would like. And, uh, and so we're in this, in this detours, we're talking about the life of Joseph and what a, what a great story this is in the scriptures that happened thousands of years ago, but yet there's so many principles that you can pull out of it um, for us today. And so As we jump into that, I want to use this word, uh, and I've used this word often, but there's this word, it's called tension. And and I don't know if you understand sometimes what I mean by tension, Uh, but I believe all of us are living in some tension in our life. And tension is defined as the state of being stretched or strained, okay? So just kind of tuck that away when you're thinking about it, The, the state of being stretched or strained in your life. And so I I believe that all of us live in different seasons with tension because God is stretching and straining us. But I want to illustrate this for you. So I want to, I need, I need two volunteers. Rylan's going to come up. Would you come up here for a second? And I just want you to, I want you to see this, what, what I mean by tension. Okay. So, um, you guys just stand right here. And uh, these, are, these are some resistance bands. I don't know if you guys exercise. Just stand, hold that one and hold this one. And just, just stand together for a second. I want you to see this because this is, this is where a lot of us live, okay? Um, this is what we want. We don't want tension, right? We want, we want everything to be just fine. We want every, everything just to go the way that we want it to. We want things to turn out exactly like we had planned. We don't want any speed bumps, and we sure don't want any detours along the way. But what God does with us and for us is that he begins to provide tension. And so as they begin to, to spread out, the, the band begins to provide tension, right? So um, there, there's more tension in the middle of this, and they're stretching, right? So now I want you to think of it in your life. And as this is provided for you, go stand a little bit farther. Really hold on to that. There you go. There you go. That's good. That's good. Now, both of you have to hold on the rest of the service, okay? Just, I'm going to see how good you are. Okay. So what happens with our, in our life is when we have tension is uh, a lot of us are thinking about where we are now. And, and, and this, is, this is representative, Rylan is representative of where we are now. Um, and then remind me of your name, Hoab. I get you and your brother confused. I'm sorry. So this is Hoab. And Hoab is, is representing kind of uh, where, we, we, where we would be in the not yet, 
Like this is where we want to be, but we're just not there yet. And so what happens for a lot of us is we're, we're just, this tension is created between the now and the not yet in our life. And that's exactly where we find Joseph in this story this morning. He's living in this now, right, that's creating tension to where he wants to be. If you remember when we were introduced to the story of Joseph, when we were introduced to it, what did he have? He had a dream, 17 years old, and he had a dream that his brothers and his parents were going to bow down to him. And he had no idea what it meant, but he thought it was really cool, enough that he wanted to share it with everybody. But somewhere along the way, right, some stuff starts to happen in his life, and he begins to live in this now as he's waiting for the not yet. So his brothers sell him into slavery, and and he gets into slavery, winds up in Potiphar's house. He's in Potiphar's house, and he's doing great in Potiphar's house, he thought, right? He rises up where he's number two in all of Potiphar's house, has control over everything in his house until his wife right? Our PG-13 message from last week decides that she wanted a little more of Joseph, right? And she accuses him of something that he didn't do, and now he winds up in prison. And that's where we left him last week. That's his now, as he's waiting for the not yet, and he's living in this tension. And so many of us, we live in this tension, and it makes us really, really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable, and, but what we have to get to is recognizing that it's in this tension, this state of being stretched or strained, that God is really working in our lives and in our hearts. Okay, you guys can step together a little bit. There you go. Thanks for not letting go and hitting the other one in the face. You guys did great. Give him a hand just for helping out. So Genesis 40, as we're talking about detours, right? So a couple things to think about, right? The question that I want you to wrestle with today is what are you going to do between the now and the not yet? In your life, like, what are you going to do with that? Um, you, you've got some decisions that you need to make because you might find yourself today living in that tension. I know some, like I've mentioned before, I know some people's stories. I don't know everybody's story in here. But, but I would imagine there's, there's a good many of us here or those that are watched online, I believe there's a good many of us that are living in that tension of the now and not yet. So what are you going to do in the now and the not yet? Because this is where God begins to take you on the detours. And, and let's just admit, like detours, I saw that, that went up there. So detours, right? The first thing about detours in your life is they are super inconvenient. Have you guys ever been on a road trip that's supposed to take you like three or four hours and it takes you eight or nine hours? Anybody been in that before? And and there's a detour along the way, like you have to get off the main road because something happened on the main road. I remember one time we were we were traveling from Orlando back home and uh, we didn't actually go on a detour. We just had to sit on the interstate. Engines turned off because there was nowhere to go. And we had to wait because a couple of miles ahead there was a wreck. Right. Those are the types of things that happen. And you're going, why in the world? I needed to get from point A to point B as fast as I can. But they're super inconvenient detours are in your life. The other thing you've got to realize is that detours, here's the hard one, it takes longer and there are no shortcuts, right? You want to look for the shortcuts, you want to see if you can get from point A to point B a little bit faster, so you're looking for shortcuts along the way, and there aren't shortcuts, God's working in your life and detours take longer uh, because he's working on you along the way, and this is what I want you to remember because when we follow Jesus, that's the big picture of all of our lives. Life is more about the journey to the final destination, right? And the final destination, by the way, not even in this, this life, in this here and now. It is in the not yet that we will experience. And so we are living, right? All of our lives are really in this tension as God is working on you, as he's working on different parts of your life. He's refining your character. Um, he's teaching you patience along the way. He's teaching you kindness along the way. He's teaching you about joy along the way. He's teaching you all of these things. And you're going, but I don't want to learn those things. And he's going, but you really need to learn those things. And so we find Joseph in Genesis chapter 40. And some really neat things happen in this particular instance. But there's three things in particular that I want to challenge you with in terms of the the now and the not yet. And what do you do uh, between those two things? So Genesis 40, 
We're going to read one through four, and then we'll pick up the rest in a few minutes, all right? So sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. And so these two guys that would, would be really at Pharaoh's side in different ways, in different capacities, in serving him and helping him. Um, but Pharaoh became angry. Something they did, he became angry with these two officials, and he put them in the prison where Joseph was, in the place of the captain, in the palace of the captain, guard, captain of the guard. And they remained in prison for quite some time. And the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them, which is the first thing. And we're going to read just a few more things in just a moment. But here's the first thing I want you to think about between the now and the not yet. Living in that tension, the first thing I want you to think about is, what do I do? And it's this, help others. Help others. And, and that's a tough one. Like, you might be thinking about that going, but, but what about me? And that's where a lot of us get to. When things are happening to us and we're on this detour, think of Joseph and his life as he's found himself in prison, it would be really easy to kind of look, look inward, right, to feel sorry for ourselves, to feel sorry for our circumstances and where we find ourselves in that moment. And he's going, um, but, but me, 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 me. And the real challenge is, is how do you, how do you flip that so that you're, you're getting to this place of going, I need to look outward in the midst of my detour so that as I'm looking outward, I can actually help other people instead of always wanting people to help me. That's where a lot of us live. We want people to help us. And it's not about us looking out for others. But if you would get to this place between now and the not yet, and you're going to decide, hey, I want to help other people. Now, in, in, in the church, which is where we find ourselves today, that's called ministry. That, that's called you finding a way to minister to and help other people as they're walking through what might be their very own detour. As they're going through the things that they're going through in their life, you're able to step into those moments and you're able to help them. Now, that may look different. It might be along the way you're helping someone that might need gas for their car. It might be that you're helping someone who needs food for their pantry. You might be helping someone that just needs you to sit and listen and offer maybe an encouraging word when they might need an encouraging word. But the big picture of it all is that you're deciding that even though you're on your own detour, and even though you're living in that tension of the now and the not yet, as you're living in that tension, you're going, I want to be very intentional about helping other people along the way. And that would probably be you beginning to use your gifts and strengths and talents and passions, even though you may not feel like it, right? Like, like that's the thing. When you're on a detour, you don't really feel like it. But when you don't feel like it, it's probably the time that you actually need to do it the most. So how do you help others? How do you, how do you begin to pay attention to what's happening with them? Let's pick up a little bit and read what, what Joseph does in, in this particular moment for himself in verse 5. He says, when they were in prison, while they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. And why do you look so worried today, he asked them. Now, we'll talk about the dreams in a minute, but that's what I want you to see, right? When you're in that tension of the now and the not yet, how often do you notice what's happening in the lives of other people? Because that's exactly what happened with Joseph in this moment. Now, granted, as they were put in prison, they were, they were really handed to him in terms of this is the, the area of the prison that he was in charge of and he was in control of. And so as they find themselves there, he actually notices they both had these dreams. Now remember, dreams are different in their day and age than they are with ours, right? So they really believe that dreams were a divine revelation. So whatever God that they actually believed in, they would believe that a dream was coming from um, that divine source of theirs. Now for us, like I'd remind you, like our dreams are because we 
had indigestion and ate a bad burrito last night. Like that's probably where our dreams are coming from. Um, but their dreams, they really considered it to be of great significance. And so they were very troubled by uh, these dreams. Not only so were they troubled, but it was visible. It was visible in who they were. Like they showed up that morning. I don't know if it was like they gathered around for breakfast and they're at their breakfast table. And like they looked visibly shaken, visibly upset. And here's the thing Joseph noticed. He noticed. And so how often... In your life, are you noticing people who are in need of help? Because I guarantee that if you will decide in your life to go, hey, I'm going to take my eyes off of myself, I'm going to stop worrying about myself, and I'm going to stop worrying about my circumstances. Instead, I'm going to take, and I want to look out for other people. I want to try to notice other people. I want to notice, like, are they discouraged? Are they disappointed? Are they worried? Are they anxious? What's going on in their life? And then I'm going to actually lean in. And I'm going to ask some questions to try to say, it's not the the cursory, you know, a lot of us live in that cursory, like, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm great. I'm good. I'm great. Meanwhile, like, we're all torn up inside. And so maybe you've got to press a little bit more. And maybe you've got to go, are you really? You want to talk about it? Is there something going on? Can we sit down? Can, can we have coffee? Can we go to lunch? But it requires you to decide that you're going to take your focus off of yourself and instead ask the question, how can I help other people? And listen, here's the thing. I don't know your story. But one of the things I know is that whatever has happened to you, God can use it in the lives of other people if you will let him. He will use it in the lives of other people. If you will say, sure, let, let's go. Let me ask the questions. Let me notice what's happening in the lives of other people. And that's exactly what Joseph did. So here's, here's the dreams, right? He says this in verse 8. He says, uh, and they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us uh, what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business. Joseph replied, go ahead and tell me your dreams. So Joseph realized what God was doing. Uh, he, really, he really knew like God was doing something. He believed this. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream first. In my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom, and soon it produced a cluster of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup, and then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dream means. He knew immediately. Joseph said, the three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as the chief chief cupbearer. Now stop right there. Stop. Don't read. Don't read further. I want you to think about something. I want you to know, like, has there ever been a time in your life where you just should have stopped talking? Right? This is Joseph, and this is really, that's all he should have said. He should have stopped right there because this goes into the second, the second part of, of like living in this tension between the now and the not yet. And, and the, word, the two words are trust God. Trust God. But what Joseph decided to do, because so many of us do this, right? We take, we take matters into our own hands, don't we? It's like I'm going to take control of this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to say something. And that's exactly what Joseph did. He took this opportunity. You might look at it and you might think, man, I can't believe like, that you, you would say this about Joseph. But listen, this is the first time that we see that he is actually talking about his circumstances. And so he takes a moment and he, he wants to say this to the cupbearer. And this is what he says in verse 14. He says, and please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. And it's in that moment you might think, well, sure, he probably should have said something. But here's the thing. Along the way, if he's trusting God and what God is doing, he's never had to, he's never had to play that card. He's never had to get to this place of going, but this is my circumstances. This is my lot in life, so to speak. He's never had to do that. 
God's been with him. We've been told that from time and time again. God's favor was with him. We knew that time and time again. Like those things are part of Joseph's life, but he takes this moment and he wants to take control of his circumstances. And just real quick, how many of you are like that? How many of you want to take control of your circumstances? Some of you are like, uh, that's me. That's most of us. Most of us find ourselves in this place. Most of us would do the exact same thing that Joseph did. But here's the thing I want to challenge you with, and this is what's, what impre- has been impressed upon me as I've been walking through this, is, again, spoiler alert, we know the end of the story if you read Genesis 50. So we know that Joseph does mature and he does grow up. But here's the thing. What you'll learn next week in chapter 41, and a spoiler alert again, remember he was 17 years old. We think maybe 10 to 13 years has passed during this time. And so you figure 10 years of his life he's been waiting, was in Potiphar's house. Now he finds himself in prison. You could imagine he's getting a little anxious. He's, he's, he wants to know when this is all going to come to an end. And so he decides to say something. But see, what you don't realize is in Genesis chapter 41, verse 1, I think, it tells us that it was two years later before the cupbearer would remember Joseph. Now here's the thing, and I, and this is, I want to say this, this is speculation, right? Please don't take this as like the absolute truth, but here's what I wonder. Would it have been less than two years if Joseph had just trusted God and not tried to interject, hey, please remember me? Could, could, could that time, could that detour have been shorter? And I don't know the answer to that, by the way. I don't know the answer. But I know my life, and I would imagine along the way, you two, that you've stayed on a detour probably a little longer because you were trying to take control of the situation yourself. And see, what God wants to do is he wants to break you of that control. And so you get into that place in the detour, and the more that you try to hold on and control the situation, I wonder if you don't have to stay a little bit longer because you're not learning what he wants to teach you along the way. And I believe what God wants to teach Joseph and really what he wants to teach each and every one of us is that we need to trust him in what he's doing. You see, we get to this place, right? You have coffee cups that have Bible verses on them or t-shirts that have Bible verses printed on them. And you might have verses that say something like, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And, and you might know that verse from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But see, the thing that we all struggle with is a lot of us, especially in today's culture, which by the way, I was reading something this week, that we have access in one day, one day we have access to more information than people three, four, or 500 years ago would have access to in their entire lifetime. So what do you think that does for us? Well, we think we're really, really smart. And so what happens is we find ourselves on the detours of life, and as we're on these detours of life, what happens is we lean on our own understanding. We lean on our own ability. And what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is telling us is trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding but yet why do we keep leaning on our own understanding and that's what Joseph did he took this opportunity to say hey would you please remember me when you're back in Pharaoh's because he it was like this light bulb wait a minute I'm here with one of Pharaoh's officials he's I'm interpreting this dream that says he's going to in three days time he is going to wind up back in the presence of Pharaoh And so I want to take this opportunity to plead my case because I don't deserve to be here. It's not about deserving or not deserving. It's just where God had him as he was living in the tension and going through that refining process in his life. So then begs the question for you, like, how well 
do you do trusting God? I think a lot of us would say, I, I want to do really well. I want to be great at trusting God. But I think if we really peeled away the layers of our life, we would discover that a lot of us are leaning on our own understanding and our own ability way more than we're leaning on God and who he is and what he is doing. And he brings detours into our life because he really does want you to let go and allow him to have control over the things that are happening to you in your life. He's, he's got something in store for you for sure. Let's pick this up because it gets, I, I, I told you last week, I'll remind you again, <clears throat> we have a little PG-13 moment coming up right here. So if there are little ears listening, just be mindful of that as we get into this. Okay, so the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation. And he, so he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. In my dream, there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the, words, the, the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. And he's thinking, he's going, does this mean in three days' time I'm going to be restored back? This is what the dream means, Joseph told him. The three baskets also represent three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale your body on a pole. Then birds will come and peck away at your flesh. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, I really shouldn't have said something. You know, I mean, could you imagine being that guy? Like, you're, you're at that moment, you're so full of hope because you heard what was going to happen to your friend, the cupbearer. It's like, man, I'm so full of hope. I'm just going to tell you. And then it's, it's like, oh, that's not good. And sure enough, Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh, verse 22, impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted the dream. It's, it's never a good thing, right? You think of Joseph, and I, I mean, how do you deliver that news to somebody, right? But here's the thing that he gets to. I'm talking about what do you do between the now and the not yet, and you're trusting God. See, Joseph, Joseph didn't completely trust God. He wanted to take it into his own hands. But now you get to this place, and what you find in the very last verse, what he says, is he says, verse 23, Pharaoh's cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Now think about that. Right? And I, some, of you, some of you totally understand that. You're like, totally get it. I can't remember what happened to me yesterday, much less three days ago. But three days, that's the amount of time that passed. Three days, and the cupbearer had an audience with Pharaoh. And somewhere along the way, he forgot. He totally forgot anything that Joseph had done for him. And what we're introduced to, like I said, next week, you realize how long it's been. And so here's the word, words. What do you do between now and not yet? And this is the one everybody hates, right? Be patient. I, I, I know for me, like I know I, I'm an impatient person. I don't know if you're an impatient person as well. I, I'm an impatient person. I don't like to wait for things. And I can't imagine what it would be like to wait for two years. Two years. And, and even at that, like in that season, you have no idea if, if word is ever going to get to Pharaoh. All you can do in those moments is go back to what I said before. And all you can do is trust God. 
but you have to be patient along the way. Now, because I know, um, I would imagine that you're kind of like me and that you're, you're probably a little impatient as well. So what do you do when you need to be patient? What do you do when, when you have to wait for the work that God is doing in your life? What do you do when you're in that season of the now and the not yet and you're living in this tension and, and, and it's, yes, it's stretching you and in some ways it's straining you. And so what do you do while you're, while you're waiting? And see, I know, I know what happens with a lot of us because I know this is, this is where I, I find myself, I find myself becoming anxious. I don't know if that's you, but I find myself at times I'm anxious and then I find myself at other times that I'm, I'm worried. Anybody worry? My mom used to tell me that I, I can make a mountain out of a molehill. Does, they, I, does anybody heard that expression before? Maybe I'm the, Like, I don't even know what it means, right? Not sure what it means, but my mom said it to me a lot as a kid growing up because I was really, really good at worrying. And a lot of times when you're living in this tension, in this tension between the now and the not yet, you have a tendency to worry a lot about where you are in your life. And some of you, like, that's resonating with you. Like, you are people that worry a lot. You're anxious. Or, or you just want to skip over the detour altogether, and you're like Joseph. Like, you just want to insert and take control. And here's the thing that I know is, like, when you're living in the tension, the best thing you can do is let go of control. The best thing you can do is just to not try to figure things out all by yourself. I remember, I've shared this story before. I remember years ago, I was whitewater rafting on this river in West Virginia, and there was one spot we could get out and swim in the water, and they would tell us if we get to this one particular area while we're swimming, and we get sucked under the water. And you're sitting there immediately going, well, I don't want to go to that spot. But you get sucked under the water, and as you're sucked under the water, they tell you, lay on your back, Put your arms across your chest and don't resist it. If you resist it, it will hold you under and you will drown. So my buddies and I, we swam to that spot. We all hit the water. It took us under just like he said. You lean back and it shoots you out about 30 feet downstream. Just like he said. Listen, that's what happens in the middle of your detour. If you try to resist it, I'm telling you, I, I just think there's something to what's happening with Joseph in his life. Like he's got to sit for two more years because he was resisting what God was doing. God was preparing him for something he had in store in the not yet. And he was unwilling to just allow it to take its course. And I wonder how many of us get stuck. And so what do you do in those moments when you need to be patient, but you don't want to be patient? I'm reminded of a story in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we've looked a little bit at Paul and his life, but in Acts chapter 16, he, he gets to Philippi, and he and Silas encounter this, this, late, this young lady who has an evil spirit that allows her to predict the future. That's actually the way it's described. And they cast that spirit out of this young lady. So they did the right thing. And immediately a mob of people come. And they put him in prison. And if you know the story, what happens when they're in prison, they're, they're shackled is the way that it's described. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know if it's legs, arms. I don't know if they're shackled to the wall or to each other. But here's the really cool thing that you and I can learn along the way. Is what did they do while they were sitting there waiting in prison? And Scripture tells us they did two things. They prayed and they sang. They prayed and they sang. I want to call that worship. Let's just call it worship. And I will tell you that one of the best things that you can do in your life, when you find yourself stuck in this tension of the now and the not yet, instead of worrying or instead of becoming anxious, decide to worship. Decide to pray. And I don't mean like selfish prayers, which most of us pray, including myself. You know, we pray selfish prayers like, please God, deliver me from this detour right now. And then the next day we pray that same thing again. Please God, right now, right now. Maybe the prayer should be, okay God, you've got me right where you want me. What do you want me to learn from this? 
how should I grow from this? Maybe the prayer changes. Maybe the prayer is, okay, God, I'm here. How can I look for other people? How can I help them? How can I walk with them on their journey that they're on? And maybe worship, like maybe singing looks a little bit different. I know maybe you're like me. You, don't, you may not have the best voice in all the world. That's okay. But maybe you have a favorite song that you can sing that just resonates in your soul. And it just, it just does. It lifts your eyes up off of your circumstances. And it places them on the one who is above and, by the way, in control of all of your circumstances. And for some reason, and I don't know all the reasons, I don't know why God does everything that he does. He's God. He told us his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. If you think you got him figured out, I'm telling you, you don't. But he's doing something. He's up to something. He's working. And he's, he's creating this tension in your life because he's working on you. And so you, in your life, can choose to worship instead of worry. And if you find yourself living in that tension, right, it would be really easy for us to be like in Joseph's land and thinking about this, but think about what it would be like. Because you, you get to those places in those seasons where you're on those detours, and you feel like you are totally forgotten by everybody, don't you? Nobody completely understands what you're going through. And while they may have walked with you at the very beginning of that journey, they're not, they're, you know, it might be four, or five, six weeks, months, years down the road. And you're looking around going, where are they? Where are the people? And you feel like you're forgotten. But here's what I want you to know, is that even though you feel like you might have been forgotten, you, as a child of God, because you are part of the family of God, are never abandoned. God promises that he is always with us, that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. And once you're a part of his family, man, you can take stock in that, that no matter what is going on in your life, he's with you. He didn't promise he would deliver you from it, but he sure promised you that he would be with you in the middle of it. And that's what he does. So I want to ask us, we're going to sing this really great song. I'd ask Travis if we could close with it today. It's, it's, it's one we sang a few years ago quite a bit. It's called There's Another in the Fire. And you're going to hear some of the stuff that I've referenced, especially talking about the, the thing with Paul and Silas. But it's just a reminder that even though you may feel like you're forgotten, you are never abandoned. Never abandoned. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Hey, if today's the day that you want to take that step and you've never chosen to believe in Jesus He's the one that God sent into this world to die on the cross for our sins. And it's through our faith in Jesus that we are welcomed into the family of God and therefore live with the promise that he is always with us. And if you want to make that decision today, I'm just going to count to three before I pray. And I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. Anybody in the room on the count of three, just raise your hand up. One, two, three. Anybody in the room? Anybody online, you can reach out, make a comment to Ben. They would love to walk with you. At the end of our service, if you need someone to pray with you, you're going through some things, and you need to talk to someone, our team's available. I'll be down front here in the room. Would love the chance to talk and pray with you. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word today. God, thank you for, thank you for our circumstances. Those are hard words for all of us to utter. But God, we believe that you are working in and through those circumstances to mold and shape us into the people that you desire us to be. And so we want to say thank you. Thank you that we can hold on to your promises and thank you that you are true and trustworthy. Help us now just as we sing to just be reminded of the great truth that you are with us and though at times we feel like we've been forgotten, God, we are never abandoned. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's sing together.